Hi, we continue in Genesis 15 today with the second scene beginning in verse 7, and we'll go through verse 12 today as we explore this powerful image of Abram being sent into a deep sleep and given a deep and terrifying darkness in which Yahweh reveals uh, God's plan for him. And so as we've been seeing, uh, so much in this chapter echoes the Exodus story, not just the book of Exodus, but the Exodus story as it's found in such diverse places as Deuteronomy or the Psalms or elsewhere. And today we're focusing on this section here, where the part that begins, I am Yahweh, I uh, hear the Lord, who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans, clearly is an echo of the frequently repeated, I am Yahweh, or God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We see examples here, both from Exodus and Leviticus, and Leviticus will also be relevant for the implicit uh, commands there about sacrifice, although this does not match exactly. And we'll also see how the birds of prey are uh, also a parallel to Egypt and something else too, uh, a couple things that are not as obvious as they might seem to be. So we'll be looking at that as as we go. We're also looking at two ways of seeing the entire chapter. One is in the scenes here. Uh, we looked at uh, verses 1 to 6 as one scene and now 7 to 21 is the second scene. We're just going to be looking at this part today. And you can see the color-coded sections that are parallel uh, in each side. So uh, as it began with Yahweh saying uh, something, it was offering something, uh, in this case a general, a reward, and then here a land to possess. And then Abram in both times addresses Yahweh in an unusual way. This is the first time Abram addresses Yahweh at all, O Lord Yahweh, and the same here, O Lord Yahweh. So that, in the connection with these other parallels here, how God responds and what God does to him, and then what God says, and then the conclusion, I'm going to highlight that this is meant to be understood as two scenes and yet one unit. Here, related to the literal, what comes out of Abram. Uh, children, but obviously the children don't literally come from Abram. Um, the seed does, and that's the Hebrew word Zerah. But here, the collective people coming out of Egypt. So there's a lot of that key words about coming out and bringing, and we see that here. So the blue is Zera for offspring or seed, and we see that on both sides. Or heir or possess here, this could be translated that I shall inherit to indicate the, the parallel here. So twice or three times here is who's to be the heir, and here Yahweh's promise and Abram's question about how shall I know I'll possess. And then what comes out here as the issue from your body and brought him outside, and here they will come out uh, from Egypt, from the place of captivity. So we see the parallels in both those uh, elements. So with no further Further ado, let's just jump right into our scene. So this is after the, the classic verse that we spent an extra video on last time about God counting it uh, as righteousness for, for Abram here. And my note below is just showing the element of scenes, and we're looking at that here already. So this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And anybody just listening would expect, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. But of course, that can't happen in the temporal context of the story of Abram, because that hasn't happened yet. It's going to be predicted in, the, in just a few verses. But the link with Ur of the Chaldeans is a specific link back to 1121 and 31. Uh, we don't see Ur mentioned hardly anywhere else, um, and it's certainly not mentioned elsewhere in the Torah. Uh, other than Chaldeans mentioned many times in the exilic prophets, especially in Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, uh, writing from that same context. So that's part of the evidence that Genesis, at least this section and sections about Chaldeans and echoing Babylonian imagery, as we've seen throughout the primeval history, is almost certainly has its origin in an exilic context. But here the specific link back to 11, 28, and 31 highlights, as I tried to show two videos ago when we looked at verses 1 to 6, uh, the parallel between what we saw in 11 and 12, which is to say an imperial form apart from God of seeking personal or collective glory, make our name great by building a city and a tower, the Tower of Babel, followed by an alternative way, God saying to Abram uh, in the form of Yahweh, I will make your name great and I will give you offspring, etc. We see the similar thing here, whereas in 14, chapter 14, the question is how you're going to get land and possessions, and he does it via the quote-unquote normal way of warfare, chasing away the armies and all the way up north to Damascus. And here we see an alternative again immediately, God says, to him, I will give it to you. And so now in this second scene, the focus is on the land. Here it was on offspring, and here it's on the land. So I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you from Ur. Uh, and that suggests that his father Haran's um, original journey was already divinely inspired. Yahweh didn't call Abram to leave except from Haran, the place where his father uh, stopped on the way. So uh, from Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land. So it's a gift. It's not either purchased or fought by war. And what is this land here? 
the last place we've seen them was in the Valley of Shaba, where the, the king of Sodom went out to meet uh, Abram, as well, along with uh, Melchizedek. And so that was the last place we saw them. And this chapter started with Yahweh just said to Abram in a vision. So we can picture this all still inside the vision that began in verse 1, and not a, a normal conscious event. This is all perhaps happening inside Abram's mind. But what this land is, is not named here, and it will be named later in the chapter, in astounding detail and an astounding expanse, an expanse uh, that never was the land of Israel and um, is, includes many other countries then and now. So this land to possess, and again, as I know, to possess is the parallel with, with the heir for inherit here. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And if we're astute readers of the New Testament, we might recognize that this echoes almost exactly the sound of Zechariah. I think I have it in my note. I don't have it in my note right there. I have it in my note here um, in Luke 1.18. Let's look at that just briefly so you can see that. Here's Zechariah saying to the angel, how will I know this is so? For I'm an old man. My wife is getting on in years. And there Gabriel will strike him silent. And in a parallel here, uh, Abraham is, is silent, but he's also going to be in the dark. It's not that God chastises him the way that Gabriel does, but it's certainly a parallel there. How am I to know that I shall possess it? Uh, and Yahweh here does not answer the question directly, but refers back implicitly to Leviticus. And we talked about this uh, in the previous video, where the uh, Hebrew uh, reading audience would have expected at the time of the original writing, or any time reading later, on the centuries later, that all scriptures understood as simultaneous that way. So the fact that Leviticus is not, quote, given until later in the narrative, uh, doesn't mean it wasn't known both to the audience, but implicitly it suggests that it's known to Abraham, Abram here, even though it's not cited explicitly. So we see those parallel in the sequence here of from the herd, from the sheep and the goats, and from the birds, and we see that same sequence of what happens here. Um, bring me a uh, command here, literally take to me, uh, which is an odd thing. And the question would be, like in Cain and Abel, the previous scene of bringing something to Yahweh, how is that supposed to be done? Uh, we see in verse 10, it says he brought him, um, which is say to Yahweh, but where and how that bringing uh, is not at all clear. And artists have a challenging time with it. I'll show you something about that in just a minute. So bring me a heifer three years old. And notice the three-year-old is repeated three times, but it doesn't have to mean that at all. Um, the word here, sholosheth, masholosheth, can mean triple, or it can mean also to divide into three, as a couple of these examples show. So it could equally bring be me three heifers and three goats and three rams, or it could bring me bring me a heifer divided in three, which would make sense of uh, how he cuts them. But he cuts them in two, so uh, it's not clear there, and there's nothing that we can tell from Hebrew scripture that makes three-year-old animals particularly important. So and it doesn't say three years old; it says three. So we're not sure what to make of that, but but. But the heifer, the goat, and the ram, and then a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And usually those are considered alternatives. For example, uh, we see in when Mary and Joseph are in Luke's gospel offer sacrifice, they offer a turtle dove because they're poor people and it would be expensive to have a heifer and a goat and a ram. Um, it's interesting, it's just assumed that Abram has all these things. Um, we've not heard much about that so far. Uh, we know that our herders, and we know that he and Lot's herders got in a fight over water, and that's what led them to divide back in chapter 13. But we've not actually seen a close-up on the herds, and yet he can pull those all out so easily here. So... As Westerman notes, the execution goes beyond the commission. God just said to bring them, but Abram not only brings them, he cuts them in two, laying each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And there are a couple elements of that. Um, uh, the, the verb here is only here in the Hebrew scripture, but it's important in the scene in, in Jeremiah 34. And let's look at that briefly so we can see how that's clearly echoing uh, in our scene here. So those who transgressed my covenant did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me. I will make like the calf when they cut it in two and pass between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf shall be handed over to their enemies and to those who seek their lives. Their corpses shall become food for the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth. And plainly, Jeremiah there is talking about the impending exile. But notice it's a result of transgressing the covenant that all these 
people in charge who pass between the parts. And so it's a symbol of the life and death nature of it. Many have suggested here that this is Yahweh engaging in a conditional self-cursing, um, like the kind of thing that some might say, I do it, you know, you can kill my, you know, my children if I do this or something like that. Something we will see in Genesis in the Joseph story when it comes out in a hideous example there when one of Joseph's brothers offers um, to have his sons killed uh, to Pharaoh or to Joseph. Actually, he doesn't know it's Joseph, but that's another story we'll get to later. So the Hebrew of this, as uh, Grossman suggests, is almost romantic. Literally reads, he laid the half of each toward its companion. A strange way to talk about dead uh, animal parts. But there they are. He did not cut the birds again following uh, the provision. I hear from Leviticus that the other animal should be cut up, but the priest shall wring the head of, of the bird and not cut it in half. And so then we move uh, into the, the darkness as it becomes here. When the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, the word for bay of, birds of prey, ayat here, is most likely a falcon representing Horus in Egyptian art. Here's an example of that from King Ramses from the 13th century BCE found in the Louvre. But you see um, the suggestion that he has the authority of Horus to uh, vindicate his, his reign here. And so this is a suggestion here of uh, the Egyptian power coming down on the carcasses. And it's also a sequence of things coming down here. So the birds of prey come down, the sun comes down, the deep sleep falls, and the deep and terrifying darkness descends. So four things come down on uh, Abram here. Uh, it comes down on the carcasses. They go from being uh, birds and animals and parts to being simply uh, carcasses here. And there doesn't seem to be any particular role they play other than the symbolism of this is life and death. Uh, the new RSV has he drove them away, but literally in the Hebrew, he blew them away. And the word there, Neshev, is used two other times for God blowing things. So he blew the, the Egyptians away, which may be meant to be an uh, ironical parody there of um, blowing away the um, Egyptians as they pursued uh, Moses and the people in the Red Sea um, in, in the Exodus story. And then as the sun was going down, and I want to pause to, to talk about the sun for a minute in Genesis. Curiously, there's no sun mentioned in Genesis 1. Uh, there is night and day, and it says that God made a, two great lights, a one to rule the day and one to rule the night, but they're not named there. Um, perhaps that's to keep them from being seen as divinities, as they were in Egyptian and other religions, including later in the Roman religion. Um, but here we see some examples of it. So it's going to be symbolic throughout of, the, of light and darkness and the cycles of the day. So we see twice in our passage here, it's going down now and it's gone down. And it'll rise when Lot came to Zoar after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Jacob will have his, as Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg has put it, his dark night of the soul, where in chapter 28, the sun sets, and four chapters later, the sun rose upon uh, Jacob. And then finally, in Joseph, has a dream that is um, that the sun, the moon, and the stars are bowing down to him, which is to say his father and his mother and his brothers. So I've color co coordinated these, and so the sun rises yellow, and the sunset is a, a sunsetish kind of color. Um, but we can see how they're much more symbolic of the disappearance of the light and um, not something about day itself. So as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. So let's look at the scenes with deep sleep, this word taredema in the Hebrew Bible. They each represent either something that God is doing to somebody with a context of dread and terror, or just simply sleep uh, in a deeper sense than normal. Let's look through them. The first one in, in 2.21 in Genesis was the anesthesia to allow the surgery to remove the rib and create a male and female out of the Adam. And now we have our scene here uh, connected to deep and terrifying darkness. And I'll jump ahead to the Job passages where we see using different Hebrew words, but the same idea. Amid thoughts from visions of the night connecting with 15.1, dread came upon me and trembling. And notice this one after silence, he hears a voice that says, can mortals be righteous? Sedok. The same issue is in 15.6. So there may be more echoes between Job and Genesis than uh, we normally think. Uh, later in Job, an almost identical phrase when deep sleep falls upon mortars, mortals when they slumber in their beds and terrifies them with warnings that they may turn aside from their deeds and keep them from pride. 
So in both these situations in Job, the deep sleep seems to be something where God can warn away from being either arrogant or led astray um, from the direction that God wants. And that's certainly similar to what we're seeing here. These others are different contexts, one with David and Saul, uh, where Yahweh sent a deep sleep, so basically to protect David from getting caught, uh, taking away Saul's spear. And then in the Proverbs, typically blaming people for being lazy and that kind of thing that we see. In Isaiah, it's ironic here because to the extent that deep sleep gives a vision, here Yahweh has poured out a deep sleep, a spirit of deep sleep, and closed your eyes, you prophets, and covered your head, you seers. So prevented them having a vision there. So to look at our final element, this is deep sleep fell upon Abram, a deep and terrifying darkness here. Um, it's a strong phrase uh, in uh, Hebrew, and it defended, descended upon him. And so in this context, we don't know if that's continuing what happened before, and if the sun going down is still part of the dream, because well, there's nothing said that he left the vision that he had in verse 1 to go into this. But God is giving him powerful internal experiences, what well, might even say mystical experiences, that will give him a vision of the future, but also a vision of the long-term future of his people, but also a vision for the audience of escape from exile. And we'll continue with that next time. See you then. Bye-bye.